Eric, last time um, uh, we, we made this attempt, I for everybody, for the listeners out there, we've been trying to get this conversation. I've been trying to put this conversation together for, I don't know, a couple of months, I want to say, because I'm really like a big fan of both of these guys. And I was telling Shane before we went on, everybody that's on the show right now is provides such a unique perspective on the same sort of philosophy that I, I think it's very interesting to get everybody's take on where we are today. So we've got uh, Derek Bros from the Conscious Resistance. You guys know him from the Greater Reset and Shane Radliff. Um, dude, this is I'm so excited for this. Um, I really don't even know where to start here. Um, thanks for having me thanks. on. Man. Let's, let's, yeah, of course. No, man, thanks for coming on. Um, so in the New Libertarian Manifesto, Konkin lays out a strategy. It's a, it's a four-phase plan um phase one through four and phase one is sort of full-on statism phase four is sort of the agora right complete freedom i guess what i want to know is where do you guys think we are now and of course there's two intermediary phases in there for the listeners it's phase one two three and four so where do you guys think we are today let's let's start with you Derek. uh yeah that's an interesting question i definitely recommend everybody who's interested in this for sure to check out Konkin's writing on this because he does sort of envision obviously this is just his theory it's not meant to sort of be like this is exactly how it needs to go or is going to go but he has been pretty uh, accurate about some of the things he thought were going to happen and so like you said phase four is the agora it's all the way at the end where he's like the state has been reduced to one geographic area and it's basically like the you know criminals are being held accountable and people are living free and, and that sort of thing and then on the end uh, of actually where he talks about phase zero, which is like complete statism before people have even discovered agorism. And then phase one is like the beginning of people discovering and spreading. So with what he describes, I would say that we're somewhere maybe at the end of phase two, early at phase three. And again, like read the words to kind of see the details about what he talks about. But I remember one thing that's clear is that he starts discussing that like in order for us to move into some of these later phases, we have to start seeing the creation of not only um, you know, defense forces, like some form of community policing or whatever name you want to give it, but basically non-state private, you know, uh, private uh, community security and, and things of that sort. And that sort of predicates what he says later that eventually basically as people are exiting from statism and joining the Agora and like they're getting their money out of the system that the state would la like launch their kind of gasp last dying breath or whatever and surviving that attack he says this last you know gasping breath of the state to try to stop the tax cattle from leaving he, he defined that surviving that attack as revolution and so that to him was the revolution and what i think what he was sort of indicating is that if by that point we have some sort of private defense forces or whatever they end up looking like that can successfully defend against the state's attack then not only does that send not only is that like a, a physical kind of a military win or however you want to think about it, but it's also a, a propaganda win because it sends this message that, oh, wow, the U.S. is no longer this undefeatable thing. They just sort of got held back or defeated like we saw in Vietnam, we've seen in Afghanistan and things like that, that they sort of fail sometimes. So I think that is, you know, obviously not where we're at, but I do think we're in the early phase of the end of phase two going to phase three where people are now using blockchain and using other types of tech and just real world ingenuity trying to think of alternatives to the state whether that is you know policing things like that or like where i'm at in mexico i mean people actually physically rising up and taking back their communities and kicking people out we're not quite there yet in the western world the u.s but i think that we could be at the beginning of some of that yeah yeah totally and i i honestly i think you just kind of took the words out of my mouth i, I would agree with everything you just said um i know one of the markers i personally think that we're probably somewhere in early phase three one of the markers that Konkin says is just as, as you mentioned the sort of creation of these um sort of private infrastructure uh, and i think we're starting to see that as a trend uh, what do you what do you think shane yeah, yeah. So I, I would I would tend to agree. Um, probably yeah, later later stage two. Um, certainly at um, you know after last year, it seems like more areas of the human experience are being kind of forced into uh, you know kind of forced into the counter economy. So um, people are going to be you know exposed to you know exposed to these things by by kind of by you know more by by necessity. Um, so I, I, I so that's that's I guess wor worthy of mention. Um, but yeah, Derek Derek uh, covered covered that uh, covered that very well. Um, but yeah, I. 
uh, end of stage two, and yeah, it's I think it's 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 early, but uh, I think it's it's really important not just that people are kind of forced into the forced into these actions, but there's I think the the combination with the philosophy is important too that they're consciously making these actions that they're consci- consciously doing these things. Um, so yeah, I think that's uh, an, another important thing to add. So then, so then, what do we have to do to get to the end of stage three? What 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 thing that people started to think about getting out of the state and the, the awareness that I've seen personally about around this growth of technocracy and how technocracy is a threat, especially to people who are agorist and counter communists who seek to live outside the system, where they're trying to create an all pervasive system where there is no outside of the system. That kind of makes being able to thrive outside more important than ever. And it, I've noticed in my work a lot of you know quote unquote normies discovering agorism and counter economics because they're interested in like well okay the, uh, what solutions do I have and when I say hey there's a solution you just got to learn about it this is a way out of their system especially when they're pushing immunity passports and vaccinations and things you get in a lot of these folks who probably never before considered these ideas open to them. Um, but really what Shane was hinting at is that you and what Konkin talked about is that you have to elevate the consciousness of the people to the sense that they understand it. Because, like, again, in Mexico, people are very active in the counter economy and in the informal economy, but they're not all practicing, you know, philosophical agorists or anarchists. They're just doing it out of necessity or just to survive. Right. And what Konkin talked about is that we have to sort of educate the people who are doing it just to survive and out of necessity to see like there's power in this, there's strength in this because otherwise, for example, like I've seen with some of my, uh, my partner's family that comes from Mexico to the U S that they see like, instead of seeing the power they have with like the gray market and the black market, they see it as like, well, we want to get legit and get like, we want to get business licenses. Oh, look, now I finally am a citizen. Now I'm, you know, they are kind of taught to see that as that's what to aspire to, as opposed to being like, wow, there's strength in the fact that we're already outside of their system. So I think that we have to, in order for us to move further along to your question, is help the people that are doing it already, realize that there's power to it, understand that there's a philosophy behind it, help the people that because of COVID are gonna be wanting to look for outside options to understand, hey, there's this whole philosophy behind this. You know, What you're doing actually has a name and there's a purpose to it and it's to get out of their system. That's what I tried to do with, with my book that I put out last year, how to opt out of the technocratic state is like bring people's concerns about surveillance and technocracy and help them understand that I believe that agorism and counter economics are the solution to exiting from that system and it just, so happens that like COVID happened right after I released the book. And so the book became really relevant now because people are like, hey, how do I get out of the system? And to me, that that's what we're seeing is that counter economics is, is the way. And do you have anything to add to that, Shane? Yeah, yeah. I mean, uh, I, I I certainly certainly agree with uh, with, uh, with everything he said. But um, I I would say, um, you know, how how do we get to you know how do we get to you know how do, how, how do we get to stage four? Um, well, I mean, uh, um, what what I'm personally doing is um, it's a strategy called uh, you know building second realms. It incorporates uh, agorism, uh, temporary autonomous zones, uh, crypto anarchy, um, and uh, really just a whole a whole combination of really really relevant um, you know useful strategies. Um, and uh, the the idea is to um, build pockets of freedom uh, in physical space and time. Um, not only uh, you know obviously in Agora, um, Agora is a, uh, the Agora is a part of it, um, but that's just one part. Um, and uh, also looking to incorporate you know living, um, you know a, a second realm culture um, and uh, uh, our, our own infrastructure too, so things like mesh networking, um, off grid electricity, all of these things. Um, I think that's how that's how we do it. Is is we um, we. We build what we want to. We build um, what we want to live, you know, in the, in the here and now, um, and, and also as an example too. Um, and uh, the way that I'm doing it here at Pasnia, um, Free Republic of Pasnia, is what I'm calling it, just kind of a joke. Um, but. <clears throat> But uh, the only people that have come out here so far, people that I've known for, you know, five plus years, gone to Freedom Festivals together and, uh, you know, had 20 or 30 people out here last year, uh, end of September, um, for what I call Vanu Fest. And um, really, you know, we're trying to expand, but, you know, this is a coercion free zone. So um, people have to, um, you know, <laughs> you, uh, uh, you got to, you know, be peaceful and, um, you know, um, hopefully, uh, you know, through, you know, the through, you know, the through this network, we can, you know, bring more people in. Um, and uh, I guess just use as, use as an example. So that's kind of what I'm working on. And um, yeah. Um, Derek, what, to what extent does big tech, what role do they play here? Are they, are they, is it a friend or foe? 
Uh, like you mean as far as like the technocracy, or or you mean as far as just tech using tech for liberation? What like role does yeah? What role does technology in general play in this discussion? Well, I mean, obviously, it plays a a vital role for for many agorists and many counter economists because of things like crypto and you know bitcoin and monero and others like that that's obviously like one role that people and blockchain generally that agorists have some at least have adopted uh, as part of their philosophy and, and their way of living counter economics so i think it's 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 a tool that we're going to use i mean we're clearly using technology for the benefit but I also, you know, because my my anarchism and my agorism is definitely informed by reading a lot of different opinions from across the spectrum. And although I wouldn't really call myself a primitivist or a Luddite, I definitely have sympathies for their concerns about just the uh, way civilization has kind of separated humanity from nature and like all the implications of that on a sort of spiritual psychological level, as well as like some inspiration from native activist John Trudell who since like the 60s and 70s has been warning of like what he described as the machine age society and just how you know they were kind of separating us further from our connection to the planet to each other and things like that so I have those sort of awareness in my mind while also making use of technology to the best that I can to try to reach people with these ideas of course but I do think that you know as it with any tool there's good and there's bad and I've kind of f felt for a few years now that we're in this sort of digital arms race between you know the, the fbi is going to continue to propagate this idea they've been doing it for a decade now like we need to break encryption encryption needs to be legal because only terrorists use it and this and that and you know the irs is increasingly threatening to come after people's crypto and these kinds of things like so they're not going to give up on this regard but then there's also people on the other side who are trying to think of new ways to hide things stronger encryption like etc how to distribute information how to decentralize so there's all these it's i really think it's like an arms race back and forth but um there's also, I mean, I definitely think that as just as principled people, we should be conscious of, of what we're endorsing through our use of it. You know, that's like this is just another action in the marketplace, right? If we choose to be on Facebook or YouTube or any of those platforms True. and, you know, whatever, like we, we can use them. I mean, I, I've I've tried to use the platforms to reach people, of course, but then I think there's also some level of us needing to consider, like, what are we endorsing by using these products? Like, I'm really in the process of. I don't use cell phones right now. I have a laptop, but it's it's still a, a freaking Windows, you know, so I'm trying to get away from that, like with Linux and everything else. I've just sort of already transferred. I don't use banks. I don't do the tax game. I don't, you know, so like it to me, it's just another area of us to try to live in line with our message of what are we supporting? And the other thing is just on the more journalistic side of things that big tech and the, the source of funding of most of the big tech companies is definitely government funding. It's pure statism. Like you, from Facebook and to uh, Google's early beginnings, you see the CIA's fingerprints all over it through their venture capital firm, Incutel. And, you know, there's lots of good research on this. I recommend a book, Yasha Levine's Surveillance Valley. Like most of the tech that we use, including the internet, GPS, and social media has either been created or seed funded by the military and by the intelligence communities. And we could speculate as to, well, they created it to give it to us so they can track us with, I don't know. But the point is, it's also the result of statism, you know? So to me, I see all kind of libertarian sort of voluntarist arguments against using them as well. And I can't claim to be perfect in this regard, but I do think it's something we need to think about what we're endorsing by using these various platforms. Shane, uh, what do you think, man? Is, is tech a friend or a foe in the Agorist revolution? Yeah, yeah, it's it's it's, uh, it's it's a good question. I, I share a, a lot of the, the similar concerns um, that, that Derek raised. Um, but uh, yeah, whenever last year hit and I went, uh, I guess uh, you know, kind of uh, down that rabble that he was talking about, um, I had I did have a visceral reaction. I was just like, all right, I'm done with tech. We're taking the homestead back to like 1900s. We're done. Um, it was it was a, it was and I, I got lambs and um, you know started raising my own food. So, um, but uh, you know since then I've I've kind of backed that off a little bit. Um, I do plan on I've got a I've got a I've got a, a, a spy phone still unfortunately, but it shattered it shattered. I'm just using it until it breaks. And I'm not getting another one until I can get a more secure alternative. Um, but um, but yeah, I mean uh, it's 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 definitely a tool. Um, and uh, you know I, I think there's there's certain things yeah like uh, like uh, you know cryptocurrencies encryption. Um, there's uh, uh, mesh networking technology is, is probably going to be of, of importance uh, in in the future at some point. Um, hopefully we can get uh, hopefully that infrastructure can can, can uh, you know get distributed somehow. Um, smart people are working on it. I, I I've, I've talked to him on on my podcast, uh, Vani podcast. But um, but yeah, it's, it's uh, um, there's there's certainly a lot of a lot of useful things. But um, yeah, it's uh, I think it's um, 
it's hard to say whether it's more of a problem or whether it's more of an advantage, honestly. It's hard to tell. Yeah, yeah, no, I, I, I agree with everything you guys said. I think that it's sort of like, um, it's like a double-edged sword. It's like anything else. Um, you know, in technology in the past, it's, it, it'll be just as, it, just as it was in the past is how it'll be in the future. There'll be good guys using it and there'll be bad guys using it. And, and it's just a matter of, um, you know, and in the end, I think the good guys usually win, but maybe I'm um, too optimistic. Uh, all right, so now another problem I think that we sort of face in the agorist community, one sort of challenge that we have to overcome is that we're sort of, we sort of see pockets of agorists developing all over the world. So we have like a good, Guys on the show, we have Derek, Free Republic of Pasni, all the Washington Center, and really all of our activities, especially given the level of a big tech censorship, but also like just the 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 sort of spying on our communications. Um, what do we do? How do we? How do we? activities well i have a couple ideas on that i mean the most for me the most basic way especially for yourself and a few others have tried to do with the freedom cell network and anybody who's listening who hasn't checked it out it's freedomcells.org and find and create often john bush been promoting this idea for five years in the last year we've seen Explode. it just really people like really latch on it. and again like people who aren't necessarily people who would consider themselves anarchists or maybe even agorists at least not yet but they're starting through this they're kind of plugging into this larger network of agorism and counter economics and learning more about the, like what Shane's talking about starting to look for like tangible ideas like hey I want to get land I want to build these things people so I feel like people are really as you said getting the ideas are clearly growing I mean but like people are people are growing gravitating towards it I think that platforms like freedomcells.org could be helpful to of course help people find each other locally because i think that we also have to be aware that as shane said there are smart people working on these ideas but at this point i don't trust that any digital communication is truly 100 percent like secure and so if you have something to say if you want to organize with your local cell or group it's best done in person but the website offers a way to find each other at the least get that connection started and then the goal is for people to start meeting in the real world so i think we can do things like that, just meet more in person, not rely so much, use the technology, but also don't rely and depend on it because we still need that face-to-face -face connection. And especially with everything that's going on, that's become more important than ever. And, and yeah, I mean, if people start thinking about what they can do tangibly in their lives, I think that agorism and counter economics and, um, you know, Vanu and just getting to the land and, and, and growing our food and generally just opting out of these systems and choosing to, take more responsibility it's really the only option we have left with whatever everything that's going on i mean so again like people are out of necessity it's like either True. you're going to live under the system and you're going to have these immunity passports and you're not going you're going to be allowed to go this place or this place only with permission or you're going to start figuring out I, I mean i've been really trying to emphasize to anybody listening to me like start thinking very tangibly i think we have to like get past this sense of thinking in terms of normalcy like really think about this that by the end of this summer or this year 2021 you might not most likely won't be able to travel potentially work potentially go to school etc without these immunity passports vaccination passports whatever and they're already being rolled out around parts of the world that to me not only is it a very terrifying thought but it does present this opportunity to show people the power of the black and gray markets and like getting out of it i mean i've already seen people using um before they become completely digital apps and stuff like that. Right now, it's just you need a PC, negative PCR test. Well, there are some being circulated via various channels that I know for sure have been able to use in Mexican airports. These are counterfeit negative PCR tests, as well as in the US to fly to other countries. So it's already happening. People are already like seeking these things out in the black and gray market because, I mean, that's just what people are going to do. Um, so I think it's like helping people see, look, this it, this is the answer. The way you're able to thrive is is by getting off their grid, growing your own food. And it, it just kind of, even if they don't become 
flag waving anarchists or gorists, they're going to be doing it either way. And I think that's what matters more than us sort of saying we've got this many members on our team, you know, because we can clearly see the movements growing one way or the other. Yeah. And before um, before we went on, Shane and I were talking and that's exactly what I said to him is that, you know, people are going to be they're not going to be convinced. It, it, it's true. We're, we will convince some people by just, you know, reaching out one on one. But the majority of people will be convinced by economic incentive because they really don't have a choice. Um, Shane, what do you think? How can we sort of uh, be better at coordinating activities? Yeah, yeah, that's uh, it's a great question, and that's something that uh, you know we're 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 focusing on too. Um, obviously, I've got my my homestead here. My my uh, you know what I'm hoping is uh, will you know what's what's I'm hoping will turn into an intentional community here over the next uh, year or so. Um, but um, yeah, we've got uh, you know we're looking. At, well, there's uh, one other one out uh, out uh, out east. Uh, another another similar like my at homestead, and we're really um, Freedom Cells website's uh, also a great resource. Uh, I'll mention. I've had had a couple people come into the Pasadena Telegram group from from uh, reach from uh, me on Freedom Cells. So um, that's. Been been uh, um, definitely a good resource, um, but uh, yeah, how do how do we uh, uh, reach more people? I think uh, um, Derek brought up a good point that um, you know people are, are, are going to be in a pinch, and whenever the, what, what, who are they going to turn to? Well, um, if if it's the state that's that's doing the you know the, that's just you know doing the tyranny, um, and they reach out to the black you know the gray, black or gray market for the solution, um, that's that's a pretty that's a pretty powerful thing because um, you know as uh, you know Ben Stone talks about in his book uh, Suggestions of Version Sabotage. Um, you know the the you know the state will only uh, you know only go away when the market demand for it you know goes away and uh, you know a lot of people you know rely on the state for you know defense and these things and when that facade fades away um, and you know agorism can be a great great tool a great tool in that um, I think I think that could you know be beneficial for for a number of reasons. Right, right. But I'm, what I'm saying is like, <clears throat> how can we coordinate? In other words, like I see like pockets of agorism developing. I think this is sort of predicted mm -hmm. by Konkin, right? He he sort of predicted that we would see the sort of like eruption of different like localities of counter economists my question is how do we connect and sort of form okay. so i was recently speaking with victor coleman who was a friend of Kantian, like through the 70s and 80s to the time of his death and he was the one who published his books and has like recently trying to save the uh the agorist archive of, of Konkins. he's got like all his books and i was talking with him about sort of what Konkins long-term vision was and sort of if he felt like he had failed or you know if his ideas weren't catching on towards the end of his life because it was just you know having this conversation and one of the things that came up like you said like building of that movement of the libertarian left or whatever we want to call it like this building of this larger agorist counter-economic movement one thing that might be cool and i'm just throwing this idea out there for anybody who thinks it's worth putting energy into when you study anarchist history whatever you think about the anarchists one thing that i think has always been interesting is you go back to like they had the first international and it was like at the time like they had marx they had a lot of the marxists they had some of the anarchists some of the individualist anarchists were there at some of them but there's you know all that history of controversy between the collectivist anarchists and communist anarchists and the individualist anarchists that they basically said you know this whole thing of you're not really anarchist has been happening for 200 years basically but they had these internationals where you would have representatives of different coalitions or groups meet in some place for like a week and they would in their case, they would pass resolutions and do some things that maybe are a little bit status, but generally the idea was to sort of hear from each of these different groups that are coming from parts around the world to say, hey, this is what we're working on, and maybe you have discussions or debates about certain topics that are involving our philosophy and our kind of general community and, and best tactics, and just, you know, there's a lot of different ways you could organize it, but it would be really epic to have, like, the first international agorist, whatever the hell, I don't know, you call it something, Whoa. right? But the idea of, like, creating this, bringing people together, and even if it happened virtually or virtually and in person, like, for people who couldn't make it, but, like, that, I mean, I think that could be cool. You know, it's interesting you say that because I think it's in, I think it's in the, the New Libertarian Manifesto, but it might be in from back from the back galleys to the stars. Konkin says that the New Libertarian Alliance should start out as a sort of risk mitigating in, institution. So, in other words, it should sort of uh, exist for the purpose of helping agorists uh, sort of lower their their counter economic risk. And one thought that I've always had is that. Maybe if we created like a sort of bail fund for victimless crimes and, you know, we all sort of took part in it. We all sort of, I don't know, created some sort of organization somehow 
where each, all of those different pockets of agorists that I was talking about had some sort of representation or, or something like that. And then, you know, almost like a slush fund for, for counter economists. Well, hey, Free Ross needs 100 grand for his lawyer. Well, guess what? We got you. You know what I mean? Or so, you know, some freedom fighter is held up. Some journalist needs, you know, $20,000. Maybe we can help them out. What do you guys think about something like that? I'm just, I'm also, just shooting from the hip at this point. Well, it's also kind of like counter economic insurance in a way. You know what I mean? Like people who are like, hey, you're going to yeah. try to like, say, for example, like whatever this group or organization was that somebody comes to them and and maybe it's like the next ross right and they're like hey i have this brilliant idea this project we're going to be able to totally just get past the banks or whatever but there's a big risk when i create this i you know whatever these are the risks and he comes to that fund you know to say hey can i be guaranteed that if i go down like i got some bail money or whatever you know what i mean it's like almost like counter economic <laughs> insurance <laughs> That, but those are the sorts of institutions, I think, that we're going to have to build to take it to phase four. Uh, so I, I so I, what, what I what I could say, and it's actually kind of funny. Um, so there's a, a Paznian uh, who goes by the name Josiah Warren. Um, who published a book, uh, published a book of his uh, Liberty Attack publications. But um, he he had a, an idea for for the Free Republic of Paznia. We he, he wanted to start the the Paznia General Bitcoin Fund. So what he did was he funded a thousand dollars himself and a thousand dollars in Bitcoin and and other pe and other people sent some donations in too. And uh, you know and and it's it's culture jamming is what we're doing. So we, what he did was he wrote it up as like an actual um, like mimicking an actual you know legal document essentially. Um, so he wrote down you know things that could be used for you know um, you know upgrades to the homestead. Um, or you know, bail funds, for example, is in there, in there too. So, um, yeah, I think that's that's a, a great idea and, and uh, something that uh, I guess yeah we've already done here. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's exactly what I'm talking about. Just on like a sort of a very micro scale. scale. Yeah, very micro scale. Yeah, for sure. But yeah, yeah, see, so, yeah, I'm into the idea. Like, imagine if we could imagine if we could provide bail for like the Hong Kong protesters or something like that. I don't know. I think there's a lot of opportunity here, but maybe it's something that, um, you know, like Derek was saying, if anybody out there thinks that these ideas are, are worth pursuing and they're worth putting energy in, we're, we're sort of running out of time. Um, but I want to, before we do run out of time. Shane, can you tell us about- Can I just throw um, in one, yeah. one comment real Please. quick before we move to that, brother? If you don't think of, of, really, I do think that we should, in some ways, take examples of what past movements have done. Because the thing is, agorism is so unique and different, and it is under the banner of anarchism, but it's a very specific kind of thing. And, and there, you know, there, it, but I think that it hasn't really quite got as organized as maybe some other movements that have been around because they've been around for 200 years. There've been anarcho-communists and collectivists arguing and debating for 200 years. There's been right. an individualist movement, you know, but the Gorus movement is really 50, 60 years old as far as like Konkin putting it in words, right? Yeah. So, I, but I think that in addition to the idea of like having the first international agorist, whatever, get together or some sort of coordination in these different ways that once some of the other past anarchists have done, you know, people have like, you hear these stories of uh, like George Orwell, for example, go to Spain to fight in the revolution or they go to, you know, try to Emma Goldman, go to Russia to try to see what their revolution was about and then learn the truth about it. In some ways, I feel like the agorists can, we can you know, our revolution isn't fighting in wars and fighting in battles, you know, it's like creating alternatives, but we can sort of take that same idea of learning from either past communities that have done things successfully or visiting, like for example, just a couple of days ago, I got to go visit Chiran where they've got to celebrate their 10th anniversary of kicking out the cops and the cartel and the police, like, right? There are some examples of people who are already living these ideas and messages that we can learn from. So I just wanted to kind of throw that idea out there that I think that could be another just valuable tool for us generally growing this movement. Yeah, yeah, there is there's so much um there's so much room for growth and like coordination and stuff. It's just you know, and you, you make a good point. You know, Konkin died in 2004. So, you know, a lot of these a lot of these schools of thought, their their founders died in the 1800s or the 1700s and they they're still they haven't made as much progress as we have made in the last 12, 15, 20 years. So, um all right. So, uh Shane, 
uh, why don't you tell us about Paznia and like what what you're what you've got going on over there? Where can people learn more and how and how can they get involved? And if you want them to get involved, sure, sure. Um, so yeah, it's uh, what I'm calling uh, the Free Republic of Paznia. It's kind of uh, it's uh, there's an idea that Erwin Strauss posited in the 1960s called a model country, and it's just kind of a joke. Um, but uh, basically, um, we're, we've got uh, um, it's it's basically my idea to you know to start an intentional community here um, here on my homestead. And uh, just for, for so people so people know, um, Pasnia, um, it's uh, uh, the the name of it. Uh, Permanent Autonomous Zone um, is the the acronym is Paz, and it, uh, Paz is also peace in Spanish, so it kind of doubles for that. Um, and uh, really, um, right now, if people go to Pasnia.com, they can uh, have got uh, you know the the stages of uh, you know stages one, two, and three um, for uh, you know what we're trying to build here, and. Um, essentially this, this year's, uh, dedicated to food self-sufficiency. Um, just, uh, um, this year, it's, yeah, this year's been, we've had a lot of progress, uh, a lot of progress so far. It's a couple weeks, a couple weekends ago, had, uh, had ducks, uh, hatching in the incubator. And uh, I've got lambs here, lambs, goats, and uh, we're uh, you know just really, really trying to uh, strive towards um, food cell sufficiency. Got I'm, I'm starting. I've got uh, birds out here that'll be uh, you know fertilizing. I'm trying to turn my uh, front yard into a little food forest. So um, that's uh, you know what I'm building here, and I'm building it with people that uh, uh, you know like like my Agoras, uh, you know um, anarchist Venuans, um, people I've known for for years. I've I've come in contact with the Freedom Festivals, and um, yeah, we're uh, we're basically we're we're trying to build something here um, beyond just uh, um, you know beyond just uh, you know. Uh, uh, an agora, but but also kind of a culture and and uh, you know some place where we can we can live these principles that we that we hold. Um, so yeah, people want to check that out, then go to pasnia.com. And um, we do have uh, at the end of, at uh, the end of the year, um, it's uh, be at the end of September. Um, haven't officially announced the date yet, but we'll have Vanu Fest too. Um, and uh, if uh, people want to, uh, to to come to that, um, I only it's uh, it, we're doing this in a very Vanu kind of security culture minded way. So only people I know. Or that have been petted can come out here to the property. So um, if I don't know you, unfortunately, you can't come out here yet. It's just the way we got to do things. Um, but uh, you know, get in the Pasnia <laughs> Telegram group, build up your reputation, and um, then um, you know, obviously, we we we, we want to have as many peaceful people out here as we possibly can. But um, we got to do it this way. Um, just so, you know, the reality of uh, the nature of the world we live in. So um, yeah, that's uh, Pasnia. Operational security, brother. And what's what, what's um, Liberty under attack? Why don't you t tell us about that? Yeah, yeah. So, um, Liberty Under Attack. It started as my radio show back in uh, fe in February of 2015. It was my my entry into the alternative media. Uh, but now it's morphed into uh, Liberty Under Attack Publications. Uh, we're a liberty focused uh, publishing outfit. Um, we offer, uh, but you know, anarchist strategy guides, um, guide strategy guides on building on, on you know increasing personal freedom. B bunch of books on Vanu that I've, I've digitized and put re put out in, in paperback format. And uh, um, uh, Gorus fiction, crypto agoras, crypto anarchy, uh, crypto agoras fiction. Lots of uh, lots of really really incredible stuff. Um, that uh, you know I, I you know publish publish these and digitize them because I find them I find them valuable and, and uh, you know very very uh, useful in, in the pursuit of uh, personal freedom. So um, yeah, we also help authors. If uh, you know um, our tagline is share your story, find your freedom. So if uh, any of your uh, listeners are authors and they're looking for assistance in publishing, um, we would uh, certainly love to uh, love to assist in that too. So uh, libertyattack.com is the website uh, for that, and I appreciate. Uh, you let me let me uh, mention that. Derek Rose, my man, what are you working on? How can people find your work and how can they support you? I appreciate that as well, brother. Um, yeah, so at the moment, we think at the moment, the most pressing project that uh, I'm kind of dedicating my time to is this documentary series. I've in the last couple of years, I've you know, started to focus more and more on documentaries. I still write articles regularly. I write articles for The Last American Vagabond, if anybody is aware of uh, Ryan and his website, it does a lot of great work. So I, I fund myself through that, you know, um, and in addition to that, I've been just, like I said, getting to these documentaries and I've been, had this big idea that I started a couple years ago. Actually, I did uh, two US speaking tours a couple years ago in 2017 and 2018. And the second year I had this presentation called the pyramid of power. And it was just this kind of like big picture, like looking at all the various institutions that attempt to manipulate our lives, not only the state, you know, as we know it as anarchists, but the various other piece of the puzzle, like you asked about big tech, this 16 part documentary that I'm producing and I'm, I'm just kind of working, you know, every week writing the scripts and working with my a couple of editors who just I've worked with in the past and hoping to start releasing it by, later on this year. Like, and uh, we're going to release it. We just recently done. So we'll release one a week for four weeks. And then a couple months later, once we get the others done, we'll release season two. And, and on 
see I'm excited about that because it, it's I can get more people. Okay, if I can get people to question the state of the world generally, whether that means oh the government's corrupt or look at this crime they're doing or this and that. To me, that can through my journalism and trying to expose them to those things, lead them to questioning those systems and then hopefully to like hey look deeper at the work. I've noticed a lot that inevitably when you start to quote unquote wake people up or get them to question the world, they you know they get to a point of okay. So so what's the solution? And then to me, it's like, okay, hey, look, check out this work I've done on agorism, check out counter economics, like learn more about these ideas and Vanu and like just permaculture and just growing your own, you know, all these kinds of solutions based ideas. So it's, it's a very kind of targeted thing. So the documentary to me is, it's not going to be a quote unquote conspiracy documentary. I see it more like a true crime documentary, like really laying out the facts, all sourced and documented but done in a way that I hope can plant seeds or, or kind of wake up more quote unquote normie minds. And then the under, the thing that I think will make it different from past releases like this, because a lot of it's gonna, is that every episode I'm aiming for like 22 to 25 minutes at most, just really kind of short and digestible, but taking on a bunch of big ideas. But each episode will feature like suggested reading or suggested documentaries, as well as solutions like at the end of like, okay, so we're talking about big tech, like what can we do? And then describe that. Like we're talking about the banking system. Okay, so what can we do? So it's going to be very much solution based as well. Um, so I minds and then just continue getting people to question the belief and authority because to me that's kind of what underpins the whole pyramid of power is the, the this predator class as i call them is that belief in authority that we all are very aware of so i'm working on that kind of on the regular right now i'm also recently started a new project to do a biography of konkin and uh, that's what i was saying i was interviewing um, victor coleman oh, wow. Got a couple starting to die. Like, and I don't know if you guys are familiar with the work of Carl Watner over the Volunteers. He just passed away like a couple years ago. I didn't know him personally, but I read lots of his essays at like the Volunteerist website when I was first waking up. So it's just this kind of awareness that like, dang, a lot of these dudes are definitely getting older, and that's why Coleman is wanting to save. Uh, Conkin's archive because he's like hey, preserved and talk to and, and various contacts that I have and kind of put like a, a narrative of Conkin's life and like who is the man behind the ideas sort of thing and so I'm hoping to release that later this year and um, kind of beyond that I mean, we'll that see what happens all, but those that, are kind of my main go ahead go ahead I was saying, go ahead if you if you were to say something. Sorry. No, I was just gonna say that that's that's that's, that's a brilliant freaking project, man. To do a biography of excited. It's really exciting. Yeah, yeah, I'm excited to do it. I, it. It'll be a first time I've written a biography, but also like I just kind of feel like it's one of those things that I mean I've really tried to. My work has really been inspired by him as well as other people, of course, like Carl Hess and others. But I just feel like well. I don't know who else, if anybody else is planning to do this, so maybe I just got to do it. And if somebody else decides to do it later, just figure, like, these people are around, and uh, who knows, you know, there's a lot of history that could be lost, basically, by not getting this story, I think. Yeah, yeah, and, you know, um, it's interesting that you bring that up, because um, you, before Neil died, I, I had him on the... Quora and I was I would go back and forth with them and we would talk but I asked him once I said you know Neil you put on um, that uh, what was it the counterculture um, it's exactly countercon in the 70s and I said to him you know wouldn't it be cool if we did that again and this was just like a year before he died and he said to me he's like you know Sal he's like I'd love to but I just I don't have the uh, resources anymore so maybe you know that's another thing that we could all consider maybe one day but I have Guys. an idea. I have an idea. I'm just going to throw a short real quick. This is something I talked to Coleman about is reviving the Agorist Institute. That's something that Sam was running when he was alive and he was just like, you know, it doesn't have to be just an exploration of agorism, but counter economics, like he really wanted to have like economics in the real world, but debating theory and really just, I mean, he had, he had some big visions. So I don't know. I think that there might be some projects worth kind of keeping these things going and 
I just wanted to say one last thing I know we're about to wrap up that Shane, of course, I appreciate what you're doing in Pasnia and I wanted to just also kind of second what he's talking about for everybody listening, like the importance of having land and getting land is that I've just been out I have about planning process over the last year when I sort of opened this idea of starting an intentional community. And we're actively like looking for land and as I said, visiting places like Cheran, trying to learn from other people who are like already considered autonomous and, and just, you know, get some resources and some knowledge and share my ideas as well. And <laughs> over here. <laughs> so my point is that it's how my community or freedom cells or whatever you want to call them. Like the point is that we need to thrive in numbers and do that on the land, being able to grow our own food, being able to create mesh networks and alternative energy that doesn't keep us on the grid because this world that they're trying to create and push us into is a very scary, not freedom based world. So if we want to thrive, I think the answer truly is like get some land, start build a term plan, start building community, start connecting with your neighbors and, and get an organized. Yeah, we have one thing that Carl has really stressed was the importance of creating local production facilities that bypass is doing and homesteading, right? Sort of everything is created in a sort of locally oriented fashion. So um we just packed into about 35 minutes this was wonderful and really listeners if you guys are interested in creating and, and putting any of these ideas into actions run with them right no one's gonna we're, we're not gonna sit here and say oh you stole any ideas it's you know we, we want you to uh, that uh, Eric Rose thank you guys so much I appreciate thank it thank you brother appreciate you hey thank you appreciate it Our strategy for liberty is the creation of a culture of liberty, a society that occupies its own protected space and implements independent systems of cooperation. We need to create a second realm. Device connection terminated. Is it possible to create pockets of freedom where personal autonomy is respected? In the novella, Hashtag Agora, Daniel LaRusso finds out the answer firsthand. After discovering Bitcoin, he becomes immersed in the cypherpunk underground. Encryption, ghost pads, temporary autonomous zones, and much more. He learns the benefits of freedom, of these tools for self-liberation, and how truly free individuals could conduct their affairs outside of the servile society. Based on real individuals in modern-day Berlin, Germany, Hashtag Agora gives you a practical representation of how freedom pioneers can carve out pockets of freedom in an otherwise enslaved world. Get your paperback copy today by visiting tinyurl.com slash agoraanarchy. Again, that's tinyurl.com slash agoraanarchy. And for more titles like this, please search for Liberty Under Attack publications on Amazon.